Hi, I'm Dr. Rick Kelly. Welcome to my channel. I have a young female patient that another doctor recently prescribed ciprofloxacin for a UTI. After taking the second dose, she started experiencing anxiety and panic symptoms, pins and needles feelings all over her body, heart racing. It was terrifying to her because she always had been very healthy. Now, I have personally prescribed ciprofloxacin as my go-to drug for most urinary infections in women or men in years past. Until about five years ago, it was the standard of care for urinary infections. But this young woman had extremely rare adverse neurologic and psychiatric side effects. It's been almost a month and she's still experiencing the ramifications of this drug. Why do I tell you this? Well, in 25 years of prescribing ciprofloxacin, thousands of times, I've never seen anyone experience that, though it is listed as a potential adverse event, and you can find reports of it as well as support groups on the internet. I don't discount what my patients tell me about how a medication or a vaccine has affected them. I may not understand it, but I listen and try to make sense of the complaint and don't disregard it. Some people are very concerned about fertility and menstrual irregularities from COVID vaccines. They may know someone whose periods were messed up after getting vaccinated. I'm going to link a brief editorial from a doctor on this topic. But here's the bottom line, which is consistent with what I've been thinking. First, the reported menstrual irregularities seem to be brief, usually only one cycle. They occurred after taking both the messenger RNA and adenovirus vector vaccines, which suggests that a specific vaccine was not causing a problem. So what else could it be? The simple answer is that a woman's menstrual cycle is very sensitive to any stress or physical change. Things like infection, emotional stress, weight loss, or even a round of antibiotics are well known to affect women's cycles temporarily. I'm not surprised that the immune response that occurs from COVID vaccination, especially if there's some previous exposure and immunity, might cause it to happen. And there has been no hard data linking miscarriage or fertility issues with COVID vaccines in the United States. So at this time, I want to reassure my patients that this should not be a reason to avoid COVID vaccination. Several people I know and many people on the internet are very concerned about the adverse events associated with COVID vaccine. In the U.S., we have the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, or VAERS for short. In the U.K., they have the Yellow Card Scheme. People are sending me this image, which shows a huge spike in reported vaccine adverse events since COVID vaccination began. Or this one. Almost 15,000 deaths, 60,000 hospitalizations, 8,000 cases of Bell's palsy, miscarriages, heart attacks, shingles, permanent disability. I understand why so many people are terrified. Some people have said, Dr. Kelly, have you heard about the Project Veritas video? Government employees are covering up severe reactions? Well, I'll come back to this. But a bit of history about VAERS. VAERS was established in 1990 and is jointly managed by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and the U.S. FDA. Its purpose is to be a national early warning system to detect possible safety problems in U.S. licensed vaccines. VAERS accepts and analyzes adverse event reports that it receives. Anyone can report adverse events to VAERS. And in certain situations, as with COVID, healthcare professionals are required to report certain events. Additionally, the vaccine manufacturers are required to report all adverse events that come to their attention. But VAERS is not designed to determine if a vaccine caused a health issue or adverse event. It is useful for detecting unusual or unexpected patterns of vaccine adverse events that might indicate a possible safety problem, like when immune thrombocytopenia was reported with the Janssen vaccine early this year, or when intussusception was reported with the rotavirus vaccine back in the alts. You can see from the VAERS website their objectives. Detect new, unusual, or rare vaccine adverse events monitor increase in known adverse events, identify potential patient risk factors, and more. 
So why is this important? Well, if you've seen the graphic showing the enormous increase in reported adverse events this year, it's only natural that you'd be shocked. But we all need to understand what is going on with VAERS and what it means. So here goes. First, VAERS is a reporting system. It's open to anyone with a computer. It's not even restricted to the United States only. People from anywhere in the world who get any vaccine or no vaccine can file a report. Many of you have seen the site openvares.com, which is a private website that downloads the public data from the actual VAERS website, so it's easier to see and look at the numbers. If you go to the Open VAERS site and click here, where it says All VAERS COVID Reports, or U.S. Territorial Unknown, you see that the reports that are mostly from the U.S. are significantly less than the worldwide numbers. The death numbers are 60% that of the total. It isn't that some deaths are not important, but remember that as of December 2020, there were over 50 different vaccines in clinical trials, and many are being used today, not just the three in the United States. So saying that vaccines cause all adverse events is like saying car wrecks are caused by shoddy design. Some may be, but which cars and which wrecks? Second, and this is the tough one to swallow, the data from VAERS is unverified. The CDC and FDA officials do follow up with some of the reports, but just because someone reported an adverse event does not mean it did or didn't happen. And even if it did occur, there's no way for you or me to know whether the vaccine caused the event or not. Now third, it is known that there could be underreporting. People may not be aware of VAERS, or they just let it go. It is just as likely that events have been overreported and entered fraudulently. But Dr. Kelly, it's against the law to lie and do that. Well, yes, and so is smoking marijuana. Twenty years ago, when there were lawsuits about thimerosal and vaccines, it appeared that many of the reports were being made by plaintiff's attorneys, who then used the VAERS data as evidence in court. According to Wikipedia, an anti-vaccine doctor reported that the flu vaccine turned him into the Hulk. His report was accepted and entered into the database. At least this time, they noticed that the report was suspicious, and they phoned him and asked his permission to remove it which he agreed to. If he had refused, it would still be there. So the VAERS system is good for what it does. It's a way for the CDC and the FDA to be tipped off to something very rare or unexpected, so these potential adverse events can be researched, but it is not valid and can't be used to calculate the incidence rate or relative risk of specific adverse events. Many of us have been wanting to see actual large-scale data on safety and efficacy past what we saw with the initial Phase three trials. Finally, we have an article published last week in the New England Journal of Medicine. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to see something in print and not just a pre-published, non-peer-reviewed internet post. This article is titled, Safety of the BNT162B2 mRNA COVID-19 vaccine in a nationwide setting. If you aren't aware, BNT162B2 is the research name for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. It's a very large study from Israel that looked at the adverse events related to vaccination with the Pfizer vaccine compared to adverse events of those who had SARS-CoV-2 infection. It does not look at the efficacy, and I just wanted to be clear on that. The study involves enrollees from Israel's largest integrated health system, which includes around 2.4 million individuals. The vaccine cohort and its control group contained almost 885,000 each. The researchers matched eligible vaccinated individuals to unvaccinated controls according to their sociodemographic characteristics, the number of pre-existing chronic health conditions, previous health care utilization, and pregnancy status. They looked at possible adverse events for 21 days after the first vaccine, then an additional 21 days after the second. Then for the infection cohort, 233,000 eligible individuals were found and matched with an equal number who were not infected. Here's what they found. 
Vaccination was most strongly associated with elevated risk of myocarditis, with a risk ratio of 3.24, which corresponds to a 324% increase over the control group. Second, lymphadenopathy with a risk ratio of 2.43, or a 243% increase. And herpes zoster infection, which is shingles, with a risk ratio of 1.43, or 143% of control. In the SARS-CoV-2 infection side, they found that infection was associated with an increased risk ratio of 18.28, which is a 1,828% increase over non-infected. And there were increases in pericarditis, arrhythmia, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, myocardial infarction, intracranial hemorrhage, and thrombocytopenia. I think this graph from the paper demonstrates it best. The vertical axis is the number of events per 100,000 individuals. The blue is the risk difference for those vaccinated, and the yellow is for those infected with SARS-CoV-2. In the vaccine group, we see a slight decrease in acute kidney injury, arrhythmia, intracranial hemorrhage. Among those with infection, we see large increases in acute kidney injury, arrhythmia, pulmonary emboli, only herpes zoster and lymphadenopathy had a greater incidence versus what was shown in the infection arm of the study. Again, compared to the vaccination arm, the infection arm showed much greater risk of kidney injury, arrhythmia, deep vein thrombosis, intracranial hemorrhage, myocardial infarction, myocarditis, pericarditis, and pulmonary embolism. There were some weaknesses to this study. It is not a prospective study and it was not blinded. And while the authors attempted to match the study arm based on multiple factors, there were a slight difference in the average age between the two groups. Also, not all of the diagnoses were recorded in in-network hospitals, so some may have been missed. It's also possible that individuals who were aware of the study, either in the vaccination or the infection arms, may have been more likely to report or seek medical care for their symptoms which would also skew the results. There were other possible limitations mentioned. You can see them in the paper, and I'll leave a link below. Additionally, since the study only involved one specific vaccine, the Pfizer-BioNTech messenger RNA vaccine, it does not provide any information on the Moderna messenger RNA vaccine or the J&J Janssen vaccine or other vaccines being used globally. Still, I think it is a welcome addition to the available information on the vaccine safety. Now, the Project Veritas HHS whistleblower video that was released on YouTube last week. You may or may not like what James O'Keefe and Project Veritas do, but the gist of this video is that some federal employees of the HHS in the Indian Health System are not reporting serious adverse events as required by VARES, a cover-up. Second, nurses are being forced to choose between continuing work and getting vaccinated against their wishes. We're hearing about this all over the country. Watch the video if you haven't already. As for the first allegation, who could argue? If this is going on, it should be investigated. No question. Who would say that it's okay or good to hide and cover up bad outcomes for any reason? As for the vaccine mandate, you can watch my previous video on what I think about those. Well, that's about all I want to say for today. Please subscribe and click the bell icon if you haven't already done that. Take care and be well.